Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, right around 10 o'clock. So uh, welcome to uh, welcome to Turnaround Tuesdays. I appreciate everybody tuning in this morning. Again, like normal, I think we're going to uh, give everybody about 30 seconds to tune in. So if I'm kind of fading back and forth from my computer and stuff, um, I see uh, Good Morning Brooke. And uh, Shay's here with us this morning, so thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Um, hope everybody's doing a good job. We actually, uh, I'll chit chat a little bit before we get into our topic. Uh, we actually had a very crazy weekend this weekend. Uh, we had five county conventions, and all my friends up in Taos, I apologize not making it. The game plan was to uh, make it. I'd actually uh, looked at a plane to get us around the state. And, um, and hit five counties, and we had 40 mile an hour winds. So uh, we hit three of the five counties. So uh, my goal was to hit the San Juan and Taos also, and we missed Farmington and Taos. But uh, we were up there last night and had some great responses, and we've been up to Taos many times. Um, but the Northern, uh, the Northern tour was very successful for us, and so we're very happy. We know that people are getting very, very excited about our campaign and, and moving forward. And so these Turnaround Tuesdays have been great also. Morning, James, morning, Charlie. Morning, Brooke. Um, we'll start talking about this as we kind of get in here because I know other people will join us as we move forward. But anyway, this week is probably the most, the, probably not the most exciting topic uh, this week. Um, but we're talking about taxes and wages. So it's probably not the most exciting topic, but to be honest with you, it's the, probably the most important topic that we have in our state. Now, you're gonna probably hear some numbers from me and I'll try not to bore you with too much numbers. And I'd love to have some questions. We actually already have four questions that was, uh, was emailed in um, before us. So we'll get through that as, uh, as, soon as, we, as soon as we kind of move uh, forward. So, but let's talk about that. Um, this session, as you, everybody knows, our legislators go 30 and 60 days and this session was 30 days and they approved a $6.3 billion budget for us. Now let me break this out very simply. Because one of our biggest issues in our state is 35% of that budget comes from oil and gas. So out of the $6.3 billion, uh, $2.2 billion comes from oil and gas. So 35% of our budget. 16% of the budget comes from a billion dollars of interest off the permanent funds, the $23 billion we're talking about. And that's where you'll hear us talking, you'll hear some of my opponents saying why we shouldn't touch that because that billion dollars goes into the fund. Now, pretty much all that money goes into education. Pretty much, all that money goes into education, helps fund education, and that's fantastic. 49% of our budget, about $3.1 billion of that money, comes from taxes, comes from your taxes, comes from you. Whether it's property tax, income tax, grocery receipts tax, corporate taxes, it literally comes from you. So um, the two million people and the 152,000 small businesses and big businesses and then large and medium-sized businesses in our state basically pay our taxes. Um, and let me break this out for you, how the $6.3 billion is, is, uh, is broken out. 42% goes into K, uh, through, uh, K through 12 education, and that's about 2.4 and some change billion dollars. 13% of that money goes into higher education, which is $722 million. And these are actually new statistics out this year's budget. So I'm actually quoting the new budget that will start in July. 25% goes into health. We know that 52% of New Mexicans literally live on some type of health assistance or some kind of Medicaid assistance for us. So it's almost $1.4 billion. 11%, uh, $630 million goes into public safety. 2% goes into early child education, and that's the battle, that's the conversations we're going to have because that's $93 million, and every expert knows that we probably need about 250 to $300 million for early child education intervention. And then about $300 million, 5% of the rest, is basically goes into others, as they call it. But it's basically um, government assistance, tourism, parks, museums, um, you know, things like that, public safety, things like that. Or not public safety, but um, um, other things like that. So that's the 5%. So that's our state budget. And again, we explained to you 50% of the budget comes from taxes. Now, what no one wants to talk about is in the last 10 years, we've lost 100, over 146,000 jobs. Uh, 57,000 New Mexicans have left our state. Now folks, every time we lose a job, every time we lose population, we lose tax revenue. So if you look 10 years ago and you look at our tax budget, or if you look at our budget, our budget used to be almost $7 billion. And so we've lost about $600 million in tax revenue annually because of job loss, because of, um, because of population, uh, people leaving the population. So again, that's an issue because as we move forward, 
That's revenue out of our schools, out of our public safety. That's revenue out of our government and higher education. And that's why our political leaders and my opponents, all they talk about is the same things over and over. And all they talk about is tax increases or budget cuts. That's really all we do. And then we sit on 23 billion in investment funds and we're gonna talk about the four, five, six billion dollars we sit on the operational funds that we actually invest outside the state also. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. So I know that's a, that's a lot. Um, but let me tell you that 49%, three billion dollars of tax revenue where it comes from. Now we all know this because you pay the bills every year or every day. Uh, two to three percent comes from property tax. Eight to eight and a quarter, depending on where you live, comes from um, comes from uh, gross receipts tax. Um, corporate tax is about 5.8, about six percent, and uh, personal income tax, depending on your level, is anywhere from to basically two to six percent. The average New Mexican, depending on the gross receipts and depending on what you do, the average New Mexican pays 12 to 17 percent of every dollar they earn to the state somehow, some way. On average, about 15 percent. On the federal level, you pay, you know, you're going to sit there and say, wait a minute, Jeff, I pay a lot more higher taxes. On the federal level, you pay anywhere between 25 and 43 percent of your taxes. So depending on your bracket, you're paying anywhere from 30 to 35 percent, almost 50 percent of your taxes um, to the state and federal government. And that keeps our government and everything running. Now that's the way the system works. I think, I think everybody gets that. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how we can improve it. Let's talk about how we can create, uh, generate revenue without creating jobs, if we can't create jobs. Let's, let's talk about that. Now we know everybody talks about GRT, right? Gross receipts tax. Now let me make this very clear. Over 50% of our budget comes from gross receipts tax. So everybody complains about gross receipts tax, and I know there's some things we need to fix in that. We'll talk about that. But let's be very frank. You know, almost three billion, over $3 billion of our taxes come from gross receipts tax, and so we know we have to take a look at that. But we talked about that. Now, when you talk to our legislators, Every year going into the session, they talk about, instead of talking about investing and job creation and investing what we can do, they talk about how we can tax things. And over the last couple of years, you've heard, you've actually heard say, oh, let's create a sugar tax on drinks. Uh, let's increase uh, sales tax. And in fact, most cities, because of our new tax plan that they restructured from pyramiding, which we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, they actually, the Las Cruces of the world, the local cities and counties have actually increased your local gross receipts tax to make up revenue that they have lost from the state. Um, and then, um, and then we always look at, as, as we always talk about taxing small businesses. We always talk about taxing gas. We always talk about taxing food. So it's always about talking about taxing, taxing, taxing. Um, instead of investing, investing, investing. So that's what our campaign's about. Our campaign's about looking at new ideas, big ideas, start investing in creating job creations, improving our schools, and creating jobs and opportunities that's gonna create more tax revenue. So let's keep that in mind. Now, let me give you an example. We live in a tax plan and a tax system today that we really haven't changed in over 50, 60 years. In fact, my father is a state legislator and a governor 44 years ago. He actually helped put some of these tax plans around. But I say this very easily, and I'm, look, I'm not, I hope I don't insult anybody, but I say this uh, on a regular basis. Depending on your lobbyist is gonna depend on how much taxes you pay. If you have a really good lobbyist, chances are you're paying zero taxes in the state on a business side. And if you have a really bad lobbyist or don't have a lobbyist or a representation at all, you're paying the six to 12, 15% taxes. Now, our proposal is we have 305 tax exemptions in our state. So think about this. If we just eliminated the 305 tax exemptions, and this is coming from the legislators and this is coming from the, the tax, uh, tax and rev uh, reports that I've looked at, if we just eliminated the 305 exemptions, um, and they're mostly corporate exemptions, if we just eliminated the 305 exemptions, our state without creating one job would generate an additional four to six hundred million dollars of tax revenue annually. So my point is, our tax system has become so confusing that I would bet you, I, I talk to small business people, I talk to individuals, I would bet you if you call tax and rev today, you probably couldn't get a straight answer because it's so confusing. So our proposal is, as your governor, is that I'm gonna come in and basically uh, change the tax plan. And let's, let, let's, the first step is, let's eliminate the exemptions that we think aren't helping the state of New Mexico and aren't helping the people of New Mexico. Now by doing that, we think we can generate about $400 million of new taxes for the state without creating one job. 
Now, another proposal for, of ours is the average corporate tax, and I know this is going to be controversial, but I've actually talked to some legislators, I've talked to some of our party leaders, I've talked to some of the legislative leaders, and they, we've talked about this. So out of the 49% of our taxes, out of the $3 billion, only 3% of our taxes come from corporate tax. And the problem I have with corporate tax in the state of New Mexico is about 85% of that is being paid by small business. So the medium or bigger size uh, corporations and some of the newer corporations that move into New Mexico where we try and get to pay, pay no, no, no taxes at all or pay very little taxes at all on corporate taxes. So really the corporate tax line that we have, the 5.8%, 6%, literally is being paid by 85% of small businesses, which is 95% of our economy. So our proposal will be is let's work with them and let's make sure that we're, maybe we can, let's eliminate the small business corporate tax of 6%, right? And then let's increase property tax by about 2%, commercial property tax by about 2%. Now the reason I say this to you is everybody pays some type of property tax. Now there's two benefits to that. Number one, if we eliminate the corporate tax of 6%, right, 5.8%, 85% of that's being paid by small business. If you eliminate that and you increase commercial property tax by 2%, that means every corporation, every business is paying a 2% higher property tax. But if you start doing the math, small business, 95% of our economy is actually going to take a 4% tax cut. And then big businesses, yes, you're going to see a 2% uh, tax increase on your property taxes, but I think that's a fairer tax for businesses to help our, grow, our economy grow. So I think that'll be a, a much beneficial. Now keep in mind too, just by doing that, when you talk to the legislators, when you talk to, and you start looking at numbers, you're talking an additional three to $400 million of taxes without creating one job. Now we know we're gonna create more jobs, but that's without creating one job. And I know we're talking about taxes here today, but taxes is the one that keeps our state running. Taxes is what keeps your schools going. Taxes is what pays our teachers and our educators. Taxes is what pays our first responders. Taxes is what basically eliminates crime and fights crime. So we all have to pay our share. And that's what I'm just trying to create. Let's create a fair share of taxes. So, you know, we're not against the legislators basically um, looking at some new tax plans. But if we eliminated the 305 exemptions in our tax plan, if we eliminated the corporate tax and increased everybody's, um, everybody's uh, property tax by 2%, small business literally takes a 4% tax cut. And then everybody's paying a, a, a fair tax. And if you start looking at the numbers, folks, you're looking at a six to $800 million more taxes a year for our state. Puts us kind of back where we were 10 years ago. And that's, that, that's without creating one job. Now we know we're gonna create more jobs, right? So again, making it a more fair taxes. Now the great thing about the property tax, the reason I want to say the property tax is by increasing property tax, and I think the average person knows this, by increasing property tax, guess where that tax revenue stays? That tax revenue stays within your community. So you're going to hear from this governor, Apodaca, Governor Apodaca administration is all about community, all about the people, all about people of New Mexico, and it's about giving you resources at the local level within our counties, with our rural communities, and it keeps your property taxes and it keeps your taxes within your community instead of going to Santa Fe, and then you don't know where it goes to. So that's kind of what we're talking about. Now, one of the couple other taxes that have come up that I want to talk about, and I'm sure we're going to get questions on this, a couple other things that have come up is... Um, Taxes on highways. Yes, we do have some of the lowest taxes on highways. And when you look at the numbers, and this is trucking, because we know I-40, I-25, specifically I-40, we have a lot of truckers coming through here. Now, when you look at our trucking fees for the state, the average trucking fee is about $172 a year in trucking fees. Um, Texas is about $800, $800 fees, and Utah's $3,000. So we charge our truckers that pass through about $172 uh, Texas is eight hundred, and Utah's three thousand dollars. Now, we're going to get some pushback on that. Now, that's one tax I would probably take a look at it increasing. But here's the issue: even if we increased it to a fair shot, a fair comparison to Texas and Utah, we're only talking about twenty-five million dollars. So it's really not going to help us that much. So again, I'm okay looking at that. Now, there's been another conversation and a big push on increasing gas taxes, folks. Let me tell you something: in New Mexico. We do pay some of the lowest tax, lowest gas prices in the country, if not the lowest gas prices. 
Uh, you go to California, their, their, gas is, their gas is about 63 cents more a gallon, and they do a lot of things for the environment and for the economy and stuff like that with that money. Um, there's been a big conversation, a big push for the last 10 years, we should increase gas taxes, and there's always been a push for a nickel to about 10 to 11 cents. Now, again, I'm gonna be talking about investing and growing jobs and streamlining our tax, our tax system instead of increasing taxes on everybody, but I would look at increasing gas taxes on our gas, five to 10 cents. It would generate about $250 million, the experts are telling us. Now, I would only do that if there was one thing. That money would have to be earmarked for our highways, our infrastructure, um, to, to expand in our infrastructure, specifically our rural communities. If that money went anywhere else, I would probably veto it because I'm okay increasing the taxes on the gases because we do pay smaller, we do pay the, the cheaper, probably the cheapest gas in the country, but I would only do it if that tax revenue went to our communities and our rural communities for infrastructure and capital outlay projects that we know is a need today. Now we have another plan for that too. But I would do that. So those are really kind of the, the, the tax things that we've talked about across the board. But let me just recap. Our campaign's about investing into job creation. Our campaign's about investing into you and to people. When we do that, we'll create 225,000 new jobs in the state of New Mexico. When we do that, the average person is paying 12 to 17% in taxes to the state somehow, some way. That will generate $1.8 billion of tax revenue 800 million dollars of surpluses and folks yes we can we can do that over a six-year period i don't care what my opponent said i'm tired of my opponents talking about what we can do now if we streamline the exemptions and we streamline corporate taxes and stop penalizing small business and everybody paid a fair tax we're talking three to six hundred million dollars of new tax revenue annually so you're talking almost 300 you're talking about almost 800 but within six years 800 to a billion dollars of surpluses for our state. Think what we could do with that for our early responders. Think what we could do that in startups and research. Think what we can do with that in our schools and our education. Imagine New Mexico being the next Austin. Imagine New Mexico not being 50th because we've invested the right way. We streamline our tax system. So that's step one before we get into the question. Step two, we know living wage is a conversation. We know we have seven, $7.40 and I'm tired of everybody talking about it and it's like anything else. Gun control, immigration, and taxes are always gonna be a, con or, or living wages are always gonna be a conversation because those are political ploys for the parties, right? Um, now look, we support a $15 an hour minimum wage but we, we have a staggered plan to get there over three to five, over five to six years and we also have to stagger it by community. Be very frank and honest, $15 might work in Santa Fe, $15 might work in Albuquerque, it will not work in Grants, it will not work in Dulce. So we have a plan of let's raise a starting, a, starting, uh, a starting for $10 and let's increase everybody's pay every three to six months to 50 cents because the small business really wants good time employers. Now we look at exemptions and we look at di different opportunities because when you look at retail, when you look at restaurant services and restaurant industries, you know, even that they're paid on a lower minimum wage, actually with tips and everything else, they're actually getting paid, you know, 15, 16, $18. Now, let me make this very clear too. What you will see as governor, I will fight the big corporations and the fight the big businesses, the Walmarts of the world. I will fight, not once throughout Walmart, but the Walmarts of the world, the targets, the bigger businesses. Because when you look at small business in New Mexico, 95% of small business is paying a living wage. In fact, most small businesses do not even pay minimum wage. And most small business owners that I've talked to, they had a very competitive marketplace. So really, we have to look at the 13 to 16% of our employment, which is really retail big business. And if you look at them and they pay a living wage and a fair wage, and we will work with them to make sure we're creating a living wage and growing that living wage. We have to do that. And that's better for our economy, that's better for uh, paying more taxes into the system, and it's just more private industry circulating. Um, I think we got interrupted there, but we're good back. We're back okay? Yes. Okay. Um, yep, we're back, I think I can see. So um, <clears throat> so before we, we start, so the last thing I want to talk about before I open up the questions today is uh, one of my opponents, Peter D., who, you know, we get along great, and, uh, and we really, uh, I really respect his platform. I really respect what he's been talking about. Um, he's really been pushing for a state bank. And him and I have been talking, and, you know, we agree with the state bank. 
even though we haven't really talked about it, I do think it's a good idea. Peter and I have talked many times about it, and I think Peter D's idea about starting a state bank is a very good idea. Actually, all four, maybe five lieutenant governor candidates have talked about doing a state bank. It's in our constitution, so yes, we can do a state bank. We think it's a good idea. And let's talk about the benefits of it. The benefits of it is we know we have $23 billion. Now, we're not going to put $23 billion in our state bank. That's still going to be invested out. Now, we're going to put a billion dollars into that, into low-debt finance loans into businesses. Now, we can do that through a, a state program, or we can do that through our state bank working through our community banks. And that's what we've always been talking about, working through our community banks. But we literally have over $4 billion, almost $4 billion in our funds at any given time, and it sits in four banks over about six and a half years on average. Now that money sits there until our legislators use it. That money sits there while it goes through the system, but it sits there in almost six and a half years. And that money sits in four banks. And on average, they make about 160 to $180 million a year on our money. And yes, we get about 20 million of that. The rest goes into the banks. So we do agree with Peter D is that we would push for a state bank because if our banking system, interstate banking has actually hurt the state of New Mexico. I would agree with that. So if we worked with, uh, if we worked internally and make sure our money stayed here, because again, you'll hear, you've heard me talk about this many times. We basically uh, don't have any private capital, very little private capital coming into our state. So by keeping our money here within a state bank and investing it in New Mexico, not only do we, do not only do we save that 180 million dollar interest back into our states, we can actually help finance low debt finance loans that we've been talking about with the state bank. And we've actually, we can finance our schools. We can finance infrastructure. The capital outlay that our legislators talk about, hey, we can do anything we want with capital outlay, but my point is we now have the money sitting there. We can actually finance it ourselves through our own state bank. Now, we've been talking about that using the community banks and using our banking system, but as Peter and I have been talking on the campaign trail, I do agree with him that I think a state bank would be a good idea and a good option. So we would take, we would, we would, we would take a look at that, and I think it would literally help us with small business and small business plans. Um, so, Peter, I want to thank you for bringing that to the table because we agree with that. One of the things that we have talked about is cannabis, medical cannabis and cannabis expansion. By us stating, creating a state bank, we can fund and, and, and bank medical cannabis. We know the issues right now with our banking systems, and I don't blame our banks. A lot of our banking system um, talks about um, how they can't take that money because of federal federal concerns, and I get that. There is one bank in our state that does medical cannabis, but think about that. We know it's a $500 million industry. We know when we expand it as governor, we'll be generating almost $200 million in tax revenues. So again, a great opportunity for us to look at that. So let me recap real quick, and you can go back, but tax revenue, we would look at streamlining our tax revenue. Let's get rid of the 305 exemptions. Let's look at eliminating small business corporate taxes of 6% and raising everybody's property tax 2% so everybody, everybody has a fair tax. By doing that, we could generate $600 million of new tax revenue. Let's look at a pay scale that's, that, uh, that literally grows up to about $15 an hour of living wages to make sure the average person, the average New Mexican today has to work 60 hours a week to pay the bills if they're making minimum wage. So we have to fix that. And then as my opponent, Peter D., who we get along with very well, we agree with Peter and we would promote and support a state bank for not only New Mexico industry, New Mexico small businesses, but to invest into our schools, our infrastructure, and would help us expand our cannabis opportunities, both in the medical research and adult usage. So that's our plan. I know it's kind of a top level. Let's get into some questions real quick. Um, let's get into some questions real quick, because man, I talked for 25 minutes. I, I, apologize, I apologize for 25 minutes. I hope everybody's still with us. So um, I hope everybody's still with us. So thank you very much. Wages, uh, oh, hold on. Eric from Edgewood, do you support equal pay for equal work for women? Um, thank you, uh, Eric, and um, you know, we didn't talk about that, um, but you, we've talked about it in the past, and yes, we do. In fact, we're the only campaign that has talked about equal pay for women and for everybody. And as your governor, I will promote equal pay. In fact, we've been, we've been endorsed by Lily Ledbetter, the, the top female in the world that's fighting for this, and went to, went to the Supreme Court and, and went to Congress. We think it's time. Now, my mother, my wife, and, and, my, and my family has been pushing for this year for years. My mother and my wife has. As governor, I will definitely do that. So yes, uh, yes, Eric, uh, I would push for that. 
uh, Martha from Las Cruces. Hey, Martha, in fact, we'll be down in Las Cruces, uh, gosh, tomorrow? No, Thursday. We'll be down in Las Cruces Thursday and Friday. In fact, we'll be in Las Cruces Thursday uh, for a meet and greet and fundraiser and to meet with some people. And Friday morning, we're actually opening our, um, we're actually opening our office down in Las Cruces, our campaign office. So Martha, I hope you can come by. Do you support a $15 minimum wage like Bernie Sanders supporters? We do, in fact, we just talked about it. I do think in New Mexico, we do have to scale it up. You know, this isn't Seattle, where you can just go to $15. So we would increase the minimum wage. I think we have to scale it up. Um, Martha, as we talked about earlier, I think we have to scale it up. And I do think we have to look at some of our rural community versus our bigger communities and scale it up. And then our proposal is every three to six months, work with businesses to make sure that if that employee's doing a good job and continues to advance, let's make sure they're getting at least 50 cents uh, an hour increase every three to six months. When I talk to small businesses, that's really, they don't mind the $15. What they mind about is having to start at $15. So I think what we can do is we can scale it and start at $10 to $11 as entry level jobs. And then every three to six months, give them a 50 cent increase every three to six months and get them to 12 to $15. Because we do have to get it up there. So Martha, I hope I answered your question, but yes, we would support that. Um, let's see. How can we lift wages for those that are working? Um, and that's from Lisa from Chama. Hey Lisa, how are you? Um, I, think that's, I think this is the Lisa that I saw this weekend. At some of the, some of the so Lisa, thank you so much. Um, um, <clears throat> Lisa, lifting wages for all, one, it starts with education. And if Jackie, my, my wife, Jackie always talks about, you know, education gets you out of poverty. It's about job creation. We have to create jobs because as you create jobs, you know, I tell people all the time, it's amazing how living wage is never really a discussion in Colorado. It's a living, how wage, living wages really aren't discussions in some of, in California and some of the bigger states. Colorado never talks about living wage. Why? They have 2.1% unemployment and the job creation they've done is way above the living wage. So again, what we have to do is we have to invest in New Mexico and our plan is to invest in New Mexico in the small business, into renewables, into our technology, biotechnology, um, cybersecurity, aerospace, things like that, that are our strengths. Do tech transfer and keep our companies here. As we grow those jobs, they're gonna be higher paying jobs. In fact, the average jobs that we're looking at, those economic based jobs, we're looking at um, 80 to $85,000 a year jobs. And then the service oriented, the jobs that come with them are usually 40 to 50,000 jobs. And then about 40,000 of those jobs are within the trade skills over the over those periods and we know the trade skills pay between 60 and 70 eighty thousand dollar years so when you create those type of jobs uh lisa you don't really talk about you don't talk about that and again as you create those jobs you have more tax revenue based on the income and then that revenue goes back into the system so i hope that makes sense for everybody um ed and lorraine from albuquerque do you support further tax breaks for parents raising kids um, for more help for child care. Absolutely. I think those are, those are, Ed and Lorraine, thank you so much. I think those are really important questions that we need to, that we need to take a look at <clears throat> and make sure that we have that. Our kids are the most important. So we have to take a look at that as we, uh, we have to take a look at that as we, uh, as we continue um, to, to do that. And I do think, um, I do think we, we, we would support that. Um, I got a little sidetracked there, Ed and Lorraine. Sorry about that. I do think we would, I do, we would support that our kids. And again, we're going to, with our educational plan, we're going to invest into education and invest into early child development and invest into our early families and make sure our families have those credits and those tools to make sure our kids get that. As we improve our early child, early family intervention and our, our economy and our schools will improve, all that stuff ha happens a lot more. Um, <clears throat> Michael from Albuquerque uh, is asking about sugar tax. So let me, let me, let's talk about that. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, you know, it's been coming up lately. And all the sugar tax is basically, again, let's go back to the legislators are talking about how we can increase taxes, taxes, right? They all talk about cutting government, cutting, cutting, cutting our schools, and then how do we create new tax revenues? No one talks about revenue taxes. Now, I'm against increasing any taxes, specifically on the sugar tax. I don't think it's increasing taxes. Now, let me tell you, uh, Michael, Increasing the sugar tax is two things. One, it hurts small business. Number two, it hurts consumers. So I don't see why we need to create a sugar tax for early child development or anything else. What we need to do is we need to reinvest our money back into our state. We need to create jobs in our state. And we need to stop thinking about how we can find tax revenue. We need to grow our economy. We need to invest into ourselves. So that's one of the things that, that we talked about. Um, 
Rob in Santa Fe, he's asking about the gas tax. Rob, I think I covered it earlier if you didn't see it. Um, I'm okay for, you know, we pay the lowest gas taxes in the, in the country, some of the lowest gas taxes in the country. I'm okay, everybody's talking five to 10 cents, uh, a, um, a tax increase. I'm okay with that if it only goes to our rural communities and our rural infrastructure, because it's about 250 million, the experts are telling me it's about $250 million. And that's what we would, um, that's what we would, uh, that's what we would take a look at as we move forward. Charlie from Albuquerque. Anyway, uh, Michael, I hope I, I uh, or no, uh, that was Rob. Rob, I hope I answered your question, but I would be for gas tax to increase our gas tax five to 10 cents to about $250 million, experts are telling me. I'm okay with that if it only goes to our rural communities and our infrastructure, because um, I think that's where the, the major need is. I don't want the $250 million going to the general fund and I don't know where it goes. So I hope, I hope uh, Rob, I answered your question. Charlie from Albuquerque, would an in-state bank allow deposits from cannabis production? It actually would, Charlie, we, we, we believe it would. We've actually looked into this. Um, and I know Peter D, who we support on this topic, I know Peter D has talked about that and we've looked into that. Again, a state bank, we could. Now, you know, we have so many resources. Um, we really, a state bank really don't have to insure ourselves with the federal government. We would regulate, let me make it clear about the state bank too. We would regulate a state bank and the legislators and the governor's office would have no oversight of that state bank. The downside of a state bank, there could be corruption and there could be legislative corruption. I'm not saying any of our legislators would do that, but I'm just saying is, as we create a state bank, I would make sure my office or any future governor or any, uh, any legislative authority would have no oversight of that state bank. We'd have to have a third party completely oversight and a complete private board oversight that because I don't want any of that type of corruption. So Charlie, yes, but we, we have looked at it and yes, uh, we could take cannabis deposits. So we are at 33 minutes. Let me take one more question. Johnny from Farmington, how are you going to sell this to the legislators who are the business owners as they are the only ones who can afford to run our, run for office. And this is asking them to pass bills that affect them. Well, Johnny, I think that's a great question. One, let me clarify something. I think there is a new push with the legislators. I've actually talked to the leadership about it. And I think the leadership is for this. We know, we now have, our campaign, Johnny, has literally woken up people about big ideas and change. I think everybody's realized the same stuff over and over and over isn't working. And my two main opponents, or my two opponents that are career politicians, have literally said what we can't do. Have literally talked about, excuse me, have literally talked about what we can't do. And our campaign's talking about what we can do. Now there's a push for the legislators. So the legislators, in fact, they just passed a, a, an oversight bill that they're gonna spend $400,000 of your money to basically examine our tax structure and how we can change the tax structure, which I think is fine. I don't think we need to spend four hundred thousand dollars. By the way, I hope I said four hundred thousand, not four hundred million. We're spending four hundred thousand um, on that, and they just approved it. It's in the budget, and they're going to research taxes. So when I get into office next January, I've talked to the leadership already. They will come to me and say, "Here's our results," and I'm sure by the time we get into office, we'll have that. But my point is, we've really looked at the numbers already. And I'm not against looking at anything else. I'm not looking at, about looking at some of your ideas. But bottom line is there is a push for the legislators. There's been a push both on the Republican and Democratic side to streamline more of our tax system. And again, let's go back, uh, Johnny. Uh, was it Johnny? Yeah, let's go back, Johnny, that um, you know there is a push for our legislators. But if we just got rid of the 305 exemptions that are already on the books, and we got rid of the small business corporate tax, as I call it, and increased everybody's commercial property tax by 2%. That means everybody's paying a fair 2% taxes. We would generate three to four, three to 600 million, or four to 600 million dollars of new tax revenue, according to the experts. So that's new tax revenues. And I think there is a push for the legislators. Now, when we talk about a state bank, depending on the policy people, I've talked to the attorneys, I've talked to people about it, policy people. Some people think we don't need legislative approval. Some people do think we need legislative approval. Uh, I personally am one of the ones that think we don't need legislative approval. It's in our constitution. We can actually start that. So uh, that's one thing Peter D. and I agree on. Anyway, so Johnny, I hope I answered your question. Look, I'll take one more question because we're at the 35 minute mark. Kathy from Albuquerque, can you talk about how we can invoice the tribes of the state economic development? Am I reading this right? Oh, how we can involve, sorry, how we can involve. Shay, your handwriting needs to get a little bit better. 
So Kathy Malkergy, how can you talk about how we can get involved in the state economic development with our tribes? Uh, Kathy, great question. In fact, we didn't talk about it today. Um, that's a great question. But bottom line is, I have literally visited with every governor, lieutenant governor, the northern tribes, the southern tribes, um, our Pueblos, our presidents and lieutenant presidents of the Navajo Nations or, or vice presidents of the Navajo Nations. It's about collaboration, Kathy. And not only do we sit on 23 billion and then we have another four or five billion over here in our operational account that we want to keep it here in New Mexico. When you start collaborating with our Pueblos and our tribes and our brothers and sisters of the Navajo Nation, our brothers and sisters within the Pueblos and tribes and our endowments, you know, our state sits between 40 to 50 billion dollars and we all push it out of state. We all invest it out of state. So what I'm talking to them about is the collaborating and we can work with our tribes. In fact, we're talking, I don't want to overstep my bounds right now, but we're actually talking, we're actually talking about other opportunities, how we can work together within industrial areas and within areas. Because keep in mind, we live on I-40 and I-25. We have railroads run east and west down south and Colorado sends most of their goods through Mexico, through Arizona. So how can we work with our Pueblos and our tribes and how can we expand opportunities for not only us, but our rural communities and doing those kind of things. And so I have, what I've heard from tribal leaders, from Pueblo and, and tribal leaders, is we've never heard a governor talk to us like this on how we can collaborate and work together. And I've already talked to them about how once a month, for sure once a quarter, but once a month, we will have monthly meetings and quarterly meetings with myself to basically collaborate to grow not only our rural communities, our, uh, our state communities, but are also uh, Pueblos and tribes. So, Shay, I don't think we have any more questions, do we? Anyway, I think we're at the 37, you know, 35, 37 mark. Uh, thank you for joining us. I hope uh, I've answered a lot of your questions. What I want you to take away from today is our tax system is very complicated, but we can streamline it. We can streamline it better for you, for the people of New Mexico. And that's, as governor, that's what I'm going to do. Our, our opponents continue to talk about what we can't do. Our opponents continue to talk about the same old, same old political step, political step, I have the experience. What I'm asking you in our campaign is, how's that working for us? Their way has driven you to 50th in education, 50th in the economy, the highest unemployment in the country. Their way is talking about, let's uh, increase taxes and cut services. Our way, let's invest in you, let's invest in schools, let's invest into our infrastructure. Let's create 225,000 new jobs. Let's generate $1.8 billion in new tax revenue based on job creation. Let's streamline our tax system. Let's make it more beneficial for small businesses and New Mexicans, for everybody, and businesses too. And let's streamline it and we'll literally generate almost $600 million annually of new tax revenues. And envision this, in eight, 10 years when I'm out of office, and I'm playing golf or hanging out with my kids because I'm not going to run for another office. Think how New Mexico will be. We'll have 225,000 new jobs. We'll have $800 million of surpluses annually. Our schools will be better. The jobs will be better. The nightlife, the scenes, our education. New Mexico will be the hopping place to be. So I want you to envision that because that's what our vision is for our campaign. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight, today, uh, for Turnaround Tuesday. Next week, we're talking about health care. Um, look, I want to say one last thing. Any delegates out there that have been elected delegates, thank you so much for going through the crazy process. Um, we have had some hiccups. We have had some challenges because we have seen some irregularities, let's call it for now, um, within the system. And we know we're the outside candidate. We know the establishment doesn't want us on the ballot because they know we can win. So with your help, your leadership, and getting the vote out and getting the delegates to the convention and helping us get on the ballot to change New Mexico and turn New Mexico around, because folks, this is it. This is the moment. If it's not our campaign, I don't know if New Mexico will ever get out of 50th. So I ask you, get involved, help us get the word out, help us um, across the state, and let's turn New Mexico around together. Anyway, thank you all very much for joining us today. And we'll be here next Tuesday to talk about health care and continue this fight. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a good day.